right, everybody. So today we're going to talk about chemical kinetics. Um, I'm going to introduce what a rate law is, factors that affect a rate to some degree, um, and then how to look at something called an instantaneous rate. So um, when I talk about kinetics, we're studying about rate changes, changes in the concentration of the reactants over time. We'll always show concentration in a bracket like this, where we have concentration, and this will equal the molarity of the um, particular reactant or product that I'm looking at. And then um, when we do change, we'll do a delta. So we'll do delta change. We could also use um, D for change. So we could have D concentration like this. So factors that affect the rate of a reaction, um, we know some of these. We have concentration affecting how you know frequently the particles collide. Remember, collision theory says that the um, more frequently the particles collide, the more likely they are to um, you know, react with each other. You need to have something called an effective collision in order to have um, in order to have a reaction take place. The physical state, so you know, if you're a gas and you're all spread out and you don't have a lot of collisions, there's large spaces, um, you're less likely to react. And then if you're, you know, a solid or aqueous really where the particles are free to move around and yet in a really close um, close, close proximity to each other. With temperature, temperature is really the big factor, and we'll go into a lot more in this when we do um, different types of diagrams, talk about activation energy. Um, and what you'll see with this is um, when we increase the temperature, we get this increase in the number of collisions. We also get an increase in um, the energy of the collisions. And so every 10 degrees Celsius that we increase, um, we usually get uh, two times the reaction rate. And so we get this huge change in rate. So how do we express our reaction rate? Well, we have a simple reaction here where we have like um, A becoming B. And they do this a lot where they have a fake reaction. They just say A is the reactants, B are the products. And so they say that the rate of reaction, if we look at it in terms of A, A is being used up. And so we would say that it's the negative change in the concentration, so negative delta and then brackets, and then the symbol for A, which is A, over the change in time, which is delta T. And so this is how we say the rate change in concentration over change in time. If we looked at it in terms of B, notice B would have a positive sign here, and that is because um, B is being made, so we're making B over time. Now, a lot of times chemists will look at something called the instantaneous rate. And this is the rate at the very, very, um, at very one very instant, so only at one particular point in time. So you know, like we could look at the rate in the beginning, the initial rate. Um, we could look at the rate after you know five minutes, and the rate will change. And you'll see that in a graph. I'll show you in a little bit. But you know, the instantaneous rate is a rate at that moment. And a lot of times they'll do the initial rate because they know exactly how much reactants they have. Um, they'll mix the reactants together, and um, there's no reverse reaction. We're only heading in the forward direction, and it's easy to measure this change because we know how much we had. If we have a colored species, remember we use the spectrophotometers, we can measure that change in concentration right at the beginning, and we can get an idea about how those concentrations affect the rate and write something called the rate law, which I'll talk to you about too. So reaction rates in stoichiometry, this is usually like a part A question that they ask you um, on the AP exam. And let's say that they have like an actual, um, you know, like an actual reaction where they had, um, you know, 2A goes to A2 like this. And then they tell you something like, you know, hey, um, A2, it forms at a rate of... 0.1 molar per second. And so they're giving you this change in concentration over change in time. And they'll ask you, well, how quickly does A disappear? Notice the difference, A2 and A. So how, do, how quickly does the, does the uh, or do the reactants disappear? And so I can use the coefficients. And this part up here is kind of showing you that, and I don't really love using that, but the textbook does that, and, and it's interesting to see. But I just use the coefficients. I know that A, there's a 2 in front, compared to a 1 for A2. 
So that means that A is disappearing twice as fast as A2. So I would do my stoichiometry, 0 0.1 molar per second A2 times, well, two A's for every one A2. And that would give me 0.2 molar per second. And so now I can see that, um, you know, A is disappearing twice as fast because there's a 2 in front. This is easy because it's 1 to 2, but if it was 3 to 5 or something, then you'd have to multiply by 3, divide by 5. You'd have to use the coefficients to change to find the relative rate. Now, um, if we graph the change in concentration over time, and now they use a real reactant here, um, that's uh, chlorobutane, and they measure the rate of change of chlorobutane over time, um, you can see that what they do is they look at the concentration of chlorobutane at different points, and we could circle all those points. And what they can say is, well, what's the rate at, you know, 100 seconds down here? So what's the rate at 100 seconds? And so, um, actually, here, let's do 600, because they actually did that one, 600 seconds. So they have a point, and then they draw a line tangent to that point, and then they find the change in y over the change in x, which is the slope, at that point, and that gives them the rate. The instantaneous rate would be here, right at the beginning, and they could draw a line tangent to that point and find the slope. That's what they're doing. They're taking a graph. They could pick any point they want. They could take a line tangent to that point, and by doing that, they could find the rate at that particular time. So this is instantaneous rates at different points, either at the initial rate or at some point along the reaction pathway. All right, so let's talk about the rate law. I just need to pause for one second, and then we'll talk about the rate law. About that, I just needed to get a drink of water. Um, so let's talk about the rate law, which is really sort of like the main part of any kinetics uh, study. It is by far the most important point that you will come across in a kinetic study. And so when we look at the rate law, um, we want to see what the effect of the concentration of the reactants and the products are um, on a reaction rate. Really, what we're only going to uh, do here is we're going to um, consider only the reactants. We're not going to consider the products and how they affect the rate. We only want to consider the reactants. And so a rate law, if we had this hypothetical reaction down here, when we write a rate law, at first it doesn't make much sense. We say that the rate of a reaction is equal to some constant, you've seen constants before, times the concentration of A raised to some power called an order, which we give a letter, I usually give it M, multiplied by another, con uh, another concentration B, because it's the other reactant, times or raised to its order, which we say is N. And so k is the rate constant, m and n are the orders. Really, it's our job to figure out what they are. You know, that's, that's our real main purpose. We want to look at this. We want to find out what the rate law is. We want to discover what the exponents are or the orders of the reaction. And from that, from using the orders of the reaction, knowing the rate, we can find the rate constant. Something important is that this can only be done experimentally. You can't just take this and say, oh, the coefficient for A is little a, so I'm going to use that number, whatever it is. You have to actually do an experiment, and so they need to give you an experimental table. If they don't, you can't do the problem. Sometimes they trick you. They'll say, you know, how do you solve for the rate law, and they don't give you any experiment, and then you can't figure it out. So let's talk about what these orders are. The orders tell you how the concentrations affect the rate. If an order is zero, it means that the concentration of the reactant doesn't have an effect on the rate. It's weird, but it's true, and you'll see why when we do mechanisms that's the case. If an exponent is one, meaning it's first order, what that basically means is that if you double the concentration, so I make the concentration two molar, I'll double the rate. If I make the concentration four, I'll quadruple the rate. If the exponent's 2, it means that it is a double um, or a second order. And what second order means is that if you double the concentration, then the rate will quadruple. Um, if you make the um, you know, concentration 4 times as much, the rate will go up by 16. Importantly, M and N don't need to be identical. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. 
We always talk about each reactant separately, and we say the reaction is first order with respect to A, second order with respect to B. So let's talk about, you know, like um, figuring out the rate law. But before the, we do that, um, we can, um, we, they'll always ask you for what are the rate um, constant units. And a little shortcut with this, um, you can actually use this, the constant units, k units, is equal to the molarity raised to 1 minus the overall order, all the orders added together, times time to the negative 1. And so this gives us the overall k units. Um, and we'll do a problem and you'll see what that looks like. So how do we actually solve for a rate law? Well, like I said, you need to have experimental data. So here's my experimental data for a following reaction. A plus 2B gives me AB2. Um, you'll be asked to solve for the rate equation, so find the orders and evaluate K. So I have these three experiments, and what I'm looking for here is two experiments where A changes but B doesn't. And look here, if I highlight experiment 1 and experiment 2, what you can see is that a is the only thing changing here, whereas B is not. And so I can compare those two to each other. Let's compare experiment 1 and 2 by dividing them by each other. When I do that, if I divide experiment rate 1 by rate 2, K is a constant, it doesn't change. The concentration for A is 0.1 in experiment 1 and 0.2 in experiment 2, both to the n power. We don't know what the power is just yet. For B, it's 0.1 and 0.1 to the n power, and then the rate is 20 over 40. Let's cross out the like terms. So the k's will cross out. The 0.1 to 0.2 can't cross out, so we keep that in. 0.1 over 0.1 is 1. 1 to any power is 1, so that crosses out. And 20 over 40 is 20 over 40. We can combine this down. 1 half to the m equals 1 half. M has to be 1. 1 half to the 1 is 1 half. Congratulations, we just found our first order. M is equal to 1. That means that the reaction is first order with respect to A. We now know what A's value is. Let's say that we wanted to find B. So you need to find two experiments where B changes but A does not. Technically, you don't. A does not have to stay the same. But, you know, we could have the situation where a could change because now we know the order. We can do one of those to see what that looks like. If we want to find um, the second order, the order for n, let's go ahead and compare 1 and 3, like I said. So um, experiments 1 and 3 here, so 1 and 3. So a we know is first order now. We could put in 1 instead of m. But either way, it's going to cross out. They're the same. For experiment 1 and 3, um, uh, B is 0.1. Emma, please. Uh, B is 1, and um, B is 0.1. And for experiment 3, it's 0.4. And they're to the n. And then we put in the rates 20 to 320. So now we combine, we cross out the like terms, so the k's can cross out, the 0.1's can cross out. We have 0.1 over 0.4 to the n equals 20 over 320. 1 over 4 is 1 fourth, equals 20 over 320 is 1 16th. When we solve, we would be squaring, so n would be 2, and so the order would be 2. So now we know the rate law, and here it is. When they ask you to write the rate law, you just put in rate equals k, you don't put in the number, a to its order is 1, or you could just put A times brackets B squared, because it's 2. Now we can solve for the rate law. We put in the rate law. Um, we use experiment 1. We put in the um, rate is 20. The concentration of A is 0.1. Concentration of B is 0.1 squared times K. We solve for K, and we get 20,000. So let me give you, you know, a sample problem you can try on your own. If this was quick, which I know it was kind of fast, you can go back and you can actually go through and look at this again, see what I did. All I'm doing is comparing two reactions. Let's say that we had another you know, reaction where we had uh, A plus uh, B again equals C. And we do experiment one, rate one, rate two. Let's do experiment instead of rate. 
So we do uh, experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, and we do A, B, and we do the change in concentration of C over change in time. Give you the concentration of A and B. And now we have our three reactions. So we're going to have, let's say, one molar. Um, let me move this down here so you have that. So we have uh, one molar, let's say two molar, and let's say um, one molar again. And then over here, let's say that we have uh, one molar, one molar, and two molar. And let's say that the change in concentration of C is 0.1 molar per minute. Um, the concentration change in C is, um, let's say, 0.2, or let's do 0.4 molar per minute. And let's say over here the concentration for um, C again is 0.1 molar per minute. So go ahead and try and solve this one, please. See how you do. See if you can get through it and figure out, you know, like how to find the orders. Um, after you do it, we'll go over it tomorrow and make sure that you can actually do a rate law. Um, so please find the orders um, and solve for K. All right, thanks so much for watching this. Sorry for any interruptions during the recording. Um, and uh, hope this was helpful, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. Thanks.